Well, we give, uh, <clears throat> we'll see if the battery is going to got another go. <clears throat> so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about <clears throat> parallel building blocks and what we're doing with our parallel programming models in general. But I couldn't resist, um, in, case, in case this one isn't memorable enough, give you something else to talk to me about tonight. We can talk about Tour de Mont Blanc and being, or, or being stuck in Europe for uh, uh, the volcano last year, but we could also, um, uh, does anybody know what uh, today is an anniversary of? This is a pretty American thing, so it's yeah. <coughs> uh, Boy, that wouldn't have come to my mind. Uh, so April 12th, Something pretty significant happened in April 12, 150 years ago in 1861 in U.S. history, which I wouldn't promise you that every American knows what it is, but for the next four years you're going to go to America, you're going to be hearing about this a lot if you go to America. And that is, um, 150 years ago today, um, uh, a federal installation called Fort Sumter was uh, fired upon and taken over by the uh, Confederate government of the United States and began the Civil War. And so um, the Civil War in the United States went on for uh, just slightly under four years, a few days or less, if you believe that when the uh, Virginia Army surrendered that that was the end of the war. It actually drug on a few more months. Uh, they didn't have texting and what the bat knock back then. And people continued to die until June um, as other armies uh, roamed around and didn't hear a word the war was over, but in any case, uh, so today marks the beginning of four years of uh, uh, remembering the Civil War in the United States, and there are a lot of people in the U.S. that like to dress up in old army outfits and reenact the battles, so uh, I think the biggest one probably in about two years will be reenactment of the Gettysburg Battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Address, probably. There'll probably be um, lots of people visit that. Anyways, a little bit of trivia. If you do travel to the United States in the next four years, especially in the eastern United States, you'll probably hear about the Civil War thing. So now you know that uh, uh, we, were, we were staring at the uh, 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 Adriatic Sea or the Mediterranean. Uh, talking about parallels and models on the day that the 150th started. So. Anyways, enough of that. Piece of trivia for you. I wanted to talk about parallel programming models and give you an update on where we are, <coughs> uh, what I see uh, evolving here. Uh, we introduced a new concept last year, Intel's Parallel Building Blocks which extends what we had started with Intel threading building blocks. We're talking about um, a collection of highly composable uh, and very scalable programming models. And those concepts are going to take years uh, to really sink in. Uh, I remember the first times I started talking about Intel threading building blocks, I got a lot of blank stares and what do we need that for and so on. And uh, that's certainly proven itself. Uh, but we introduced Intel Silk Plus in our compilers last year, and we're still working on array building blocks. It's been in an extended beta, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about where that's at as well, uh, give you an update. But the opportunity for parallel programming, the parallelism we need to write a parallel program, it's out there. But Representing how to do programming in a scalable fashion, that's the challenge. And this is going to take decades to completely internalize and use it to its full extent and make it blend in. But we're seeing a lot of uh, activities in progress. And I just keep coming back to that, that the, the fundamental shift here for programmers for parallelism become intuitive is understanding scaling. Simply put, scaling is the ability of a program to take advantage of more resources 
let's say, processor cores as they become available. So if you have a program that runs great on four, if it happens, if you happen to run it on a six core, it'll run faster, it'll run faster on a ten, a hundred, a thousand, a million, whatever. Um, programs in general, any algorithm is going to run out of steam at some point based on scaling. Uh, and there's all sorts of studies on this, and you know, Omdahl's law from uh, more than 40 years ago talks about why scaling may get limited. But I like to focus on what can we do in our tools and our programming models that will um, encourage us to write scalable programs. So I think every time we try to tackle a programming challenge in the industry, we fall back and we produce very simple methods to, to program it all, and then we evolve them over time. And if we take a look at anything we've done, if we take a look at programming, the earliest machines could only be programmed in assembly language, but that let you program them. And heavens, the earliest machine languages were, were keyed in on front panels and they weren't even symbolic. I, used to be people made a big deal out of assemblers that had uh, handled symbols and then eventually some of them even handled macros. That was powerful assembly language programming. Um, the next step really was to invent programming languages that gave us <coughs> solve some simple problems like not making us worry about exact memory addresses and so forth, the uh, symbolic compilers for things like Fortran and COBOL. Um, but as time evolved, we got more sophisticated. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting with Fortran and COBOL because Fortran survived to today by evolving. COBOL's fallen out of favor. It did not evolve as much. Um, and that's not the only reason it didn't survive, but it's... Um, uh, but C and C++ brought things like block structured language and object orientation to us. Java took that to some new levels. Uh, Fortran has added block structured programming. And if you look at that block structured programming, the original Fortran was not... didn't orient itself towards block structured programming didn't have reentrant functions. You, you, a function couldn't end up calling itself. Um, those things got evolved. Well, if you look back at the earliest days, it's amazing you could get a program to work. Well, you couldn't realistically have written a program like we write today reliably using the earliest Fortran's and COBOL. Um, they simply didn't lend themselves to large programs. And a big part of that was they weren't composable. Take something simple like the fact that Fortran didn't support reentrant functions. You, you couldn't write the same program that most people would like to today because you had to make sure that a function never was entered if it was already entered um, at, the t at the same point in time. Or you can't use it in a multi-threaded program like today because if one thread's in that function, another thread can't be. Well, Fortran grew past that, but I think it's an example to me of how we just learn as we go along. So if we look at, uh, if we think about parallelism, native threads let you do anything you want, and that's been the way people have accessed parallel programming for a long time uh, in shared memory machines. It's just to call the native thread interfaces and do their own thing. But these programs don't tend to scale, you don't get any help from the tools, and they're very program of problematic. You take a look at some other things like CUDA and OpenCL, these are oriented towards trying to extract parallelism out of a different type of hardware, out of GPUs. Um, and they're very low level, um, and that brings with it some problems, but benefits. Uh, I'm not trying to say any of these are bad, assembly language programming is wonderful. Um, it got you exactly you know, the access to the hardware you need. CUDA and OpenCL will get you the access you want to that hardware, but at a low level. But as we go up, we look at OpenMP, or we look at um, threading building blocks, we're getting some levels of abstraction that help. Now these are uh, hopefully somewhat thought-provoking thoughts, but I'm also trying to say it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you'll have a bake-off between uh, one of these, and it eliminates the need for the other. Uh, Java didn't come along and kill off C++. Um, Fortran didn't come along and kill off all the use of assembly language. And C didn't kill off all Fortran. Um, and, and this isn't a perfect evolution either, but it's... Um, 
people will argue adamantly that Java is the uh, a highly productive programming environment and that it's better than C++. <coughs> and you'll get arguments both ways, plus and pros and cons. But if you take Java and compare it back to assembly language, I don't think anyone will argue what, which one's the more productive and more likely to succeed programming environment um, for big programs. The same thing's happening with parallelism. Uh, as we look at some of these highly composable and scalable models, uh, they're you know, a slam dunk that they're better than going back to native threads. Um, but I'll argue that they're an evolution um, against all the models before them. Um, that eventually means that they're the right solutions. So, at Intel, the group that I work with, I guess all of Intel, but the tools group too. We have a pretty simple philosophy. We want to make sure that for all these programming models, that the absolute best support for those programming models in the industry exists for Intel platforms. So I don't want to hear that there's some cool programming environment, but it works best on someone else's platform. So We'll get involved and work to make sure that you've got great support for all of these models. But then we also take up the task of trying to improve the state of the practice. So uh, projects like Intel Threading Building Blocks were all about trying to up the ante and improve things for everybody. So what do we what have we done about the first thing? About making sure that everything that we think is important, <coughs> industry thinks is important. Uh, has the best support on Intel. Um, now, in some cases, there may be there's a bunch of programming models I don't even mention that I think run best on Intel just because Intel's got a great platform and they work on uh, our platform. But some of these we've taken a personal interest in and worked on. Um, I, I'm willing to stake, put the stake out there. We've got the best implementation of OpenMP in the industry. We support the full OpenMP 3.0 standard. Uh, we're very, very active in making it high performance, and it's in the Intel compilers. Uh, and it'll benchmark very well on, on uh, Intel and compatible processors. Uh, we've worked very hard to make Intel's OpenMP library the best. Uh, there are some very great op options out there for open or for MPI, uh, and uh, there's there'll always be a debate. Is Intel absolutely the best? Uh, there's some extreme scaling and such. I think we are the best choice overall, uh, and we're very proud that there are other options out there as well. Uh, Coarray Fortran, fantastic implementation, uh, a lot to learn. The standard's very new. Um, but we've made a very serious uh, co-array Fortran implementation that we think uh, uh, should be uh, or rates as the best available on our platforms. Uh, parallel math libraries. <coughs> that can, our math libraries can take advantage of parallelism. Our multimedia libraries can take advantage of parallelism. Our uh, integrated performance primitives and our media SDK. Uh, this task stealing concept that originated in MIT in the mid 90s. I think we've got the best support um, uh, is on Intel's platforms, uh, or the Intel platform has best support. Now, this support also spills over to many other environments as well. Intel Threading Building Blocks has been successful on other platforms, but uh, none of those platforms are better. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that the Intel platform running TVB is better than running it on a Spark and so on, because I don't think it is. But uh, the objective here isn't necessarily always to beat all the other platforms, it's to make sure that Intel's platforms are a reasonable choice. And then OpenCL is the latest in this. Uh, OpenCL has gotten a lot of um, <coughs> fanfare and a lot of attention, and we have a version of OpenCL available, and uh, we have worked very hard to make uh, the Intel platform a very compelling platform to run OpenCL on. Um, and this is for um, CPU support, but when we introduce Mike, we'll have OpenCL on Mike as well. So I'm going to spend most the rest of my time talking about how we're trying to invent and promote new models that I think will be extremely important, important for the industry. 
on extending what we've done with threading building blocks, but I don't want anyone to be confused. We're supporting lots of methods to get at parallelism in the hardware, and that's extremely important for us. I think it's extremely important for our customers, and all of these we're dead serious about being the absolute best. 